getting into Sky Channel for the last five years and that's just been so much fun. It was probably my dream job as a kid to work at Sky and so to do that day in day out, it's been fantastic. Funny enough, I think it's John Tapp. I think just growing up at that age, he was the voice that I sort of put with racing and it was just his calls. I think he would call superimpose and some of those sort of big wins when I was at that age where it really sort of sunk into your body and skin that you know you want to live and breathe racing. And I think those moments sort of comes to John Tapp. Probably Ian Craig was straight after that. So he was probably the next voice that I remember just as sort of that race calling and racing moment sort of thing. Um, so I'd say those two are the two that definitely resonate most with me. First start in racing would have been a guy called Glenn Robbins, an ex-journalist. He had his own business uh, up and running, which wasn't far from where I lived. And I met him through friends and talked my way into a job. The moment that got me into the media was probably just post uni, actually. I wanted to do a uni course in uh, sports media, uh, but I was talked out of that and did a totally different degree. Uh, finished the degree, got into business, was working there for about six months and um, I remember it was around Melbourne Cup time uh, and it was a very structured workplace and they wouldn't be very flexible with when you could get out and duck across the tab to watch uh, the big races during the spring. So I had a good think about it and thought this isn't for me, I need to be able to watch races whenever I want and the only way I'll be able to do that is to work in racing. So uh, I quit very soon after that and started looking for jobs in racing. It's been really interesting the last probably 25 years uh, because I've done so many different things uh, from just editing racing publications to get started uh, and then writing my own uh, stories and articles, travelling around the world following the races and reporting on the races, uh, managing jockeys and then eventually getting into Sky Channel for the last five years. It's just exciting. I think you just get that real buzz uh, now, especially with days like the Everest and I haven't been able to work on every Everest day, but I've got to do most of them. And I get, I've, I've worked most of the big race days all across Australia, really, like down in Melbourne, up in Sydney. I've got to work all of them. I've got to work overseas on some big race days. So you just get that buzz and it's, it's sort of the build up to the race day. And then on race day itself, from the moment you get up until the moment you probably leave the racetrack, it's just a big buzz, a big blur. It's exciting. You never know what's going to happen. Giga kick, giga kick down the outside, wins the Everest. Uh, what do I look for when backing a winner? I mean, I've come from the old ratings background, so you to, to do it really well, I think you've got to price your own market. You've got to assess your own market, which means pricing every horse takes a long time. And I think that evolves even from when I learned to do it 20 odd years ago to what I do today is very different. Uh, but it starts with just obviously knowing your form. You've got figures for each run that a horse has put in. These days, I think a lot of it comes down to, to is doing, getting your speed maps right. And you know, the old saying, if you get the pace right, you'll get the race right. And you know, I like to stick with that because I think if you get the map pretty much bang on, you're going to go very close to getting the winners. And uh, so it's a, probably much a combination these days. You've got to know your form, but you've also got to know how the race will unfold. I probably shop early. Uh, I think that's just my background and it's hard to get away from. Uh, it's a very hard to shop early these days, but you can still do it and I still do it. Uh, but a lot of very good judges have told me it may be best to wait as late as possible to get all that information together and that makes sense to me as well. So even though I still do bed early from old habits, uh, it's not something I'm locked into forever. It has changed over time in that I put a lot more weight into how a race will be run or anticipating how a race will be run. So even though I've got my figures and I've got a horse come up as a $2 favourite and should probably win the race, if the map's totally against that horse, then I may reconsider and look at putting in something else that's going to get a better run, that may be a slightly better price or offers a little bit better value in the market. So probably the fact that I put a lot more emphasis now on speed maps and race shape than just pure data. Now, no, no price too short or too long. I think with me personally, uh, I find that the really short of the odds, they win more often, that's obvious, but it's a lot harder to make much money out of them unless you're betting in huge amounts and uh, I sort of tip for punters that don't bet in huge amounts and I'm not a punter that bets in massive cricket score numbers so for me it's all about I'd rather have the same amount on something at $2.50 as I would on something at $25 and that way you're going to miss a lot more backing that $25 horse but when you do get it right you're going to win a lot more for a smaller outlay so for me that's pretty much what I concentrate on and it's worked for a long time.